the next speaker is Dr. Vace Mangarian. Dr. Vace Mangarian has actively contributed to the cultural life of Los Angeles for more than three decades. A multifaceted artist, Mangarian distinguishes himself as a pianist, composer, lecturer, and teacher. He has performed in major cities on four continents and has frequently appeared as a soloist with orchestras, including his acclaimed performance with the Armenian Philanthropic Orchestra, excuse me, Philharmonic Orchestra in Yerevan. He gave an unprecedented performance of the complete piano music of Arno Babajanian in his New York debut at Carnegie Hall's Wild Recital Hall. Mangarhan has authored three volumes of books titled Armenian Culture. Given their conceptual uniqueness and originality of content, they have been adopted by several Armenian schools in the diaspora. Mangarian holds a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from the University of Southern California's Thornton School of Music, a member of the Music Teachers Association of California. Mangarian is on the faculty at the Pasadena Conservatory of Music. His talk is titled Armenian Contributions to the Musical Life of the Ottoman Empire and Beyond. Mr. Mankarian. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Shemasian. In 1453, Mehmed II, also known as Mehmed al-Fatih, the Conqueror, at the ripe old age of 21, conquered the Invictus city of Constantinople. Mehmed II, as with many of his successors, immediately surrounded himself with all sorts of advisors, artists, poets, and many intellectuals of different nationalities from within and out of his conquered lands to develop his vision of a progressive empire. As part of this vision, in 1461, he invited Hovagim, the Armenian metropolitan of the city of Bursa, to Constantinople, and instated him as the first patriarch in Constantinople, the spiritual and political leader of the Armenian people living in his empire. Thus, Constantinople, for the next four and a half centuries, developed into the economic, cultural, and political center of the Ottoman Empire, or Ottoman Armenian life, or the Western Armenians. For two centuries following the fall of Constantinople, the Ottoman Empire pushed and plowed its way through Eastern Europe, twice reaching the gates of Vienna. During its second attack, as the massive Ottoman army besieged the walls of Vienna on 9-11-1683, the Viennese and their European allies were at once engaged in the battle and awed by their enemy. This in, large part, this, in large part, was due not only to the colorful display of the Janissary outfits, but especially of the Mehtare musicians of the swelling Ottoman army. What an awesome sound must have reverberated throughout the city as the Ottoman band of musicians, pounding away in rhythm, encouraged the Janissaries to climb the walls of Vienna. What a frightening raucous it must have been for the Viennese, who at the time were just transitioning from the Renaissance and heading towards the age of refined classicism. Imagine witnessing this through the eyes of a 17th century Viennese, hearing the piercing sounds of the blaring instruments with the combined sounds of the drums and cymbals, which were certainly not used in that combination either by the European military or the classical musicians. The immense sounds of the numerous instruments, like the boru trumpets, the zurna, and the davul, accompanied by the clashing zil cymbals, must have sounded like the gates of hell had opened. And after all, that was the intended effect. As bewildering as all of this was, and even though the Europeans initially ridiculed it, it soon became in vogue. A la turka fever and the turkeri fad had infected the Europeans at hitherto unforeseen swiftness for the duration of the next hundred years or so. Indeed, these sounds soon found their way into European music. Although one encounters the first usage of Turkish crash symbol in Nikolaus 
Strunk's 1680 opera, Esther. It was not until Christoph Gluck's 1760 opera, Le Cadis du Pé, where for the first time the bass drum and cymbals are used together in a European classical composition. Thereafter, European classical musicians tried to reproduce the sounds of the Ottoman Mehtare music band in all sorts of compositions. These included operas such as Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio to orchestral works by Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, as well as from piano concerti to solo piano works, the most famous being Mozart's Rondo alla Turca, the third movement from his piano sonata in A major, Kirchhoff listing 331. It must be mentioned that Beethoven, through the finale movement of his Ninth Symphony, established a tradition of writing European classical concert music where the incorporation of the bass drum, triangle, cymbals, and piccolo would not evoke an a la turca atmosphere. After this, and especially in the late Romantic period, symphonic composers made use of these instruments freely and regularly as part of the Western classical musical syntax. The primary way the ala turca sound was created in the 18th century European classical orchestra was through the usage of the cymbal. The sound of the cymbal became so popular that some piano companies went as far as to add a pedal for the piano called the Janissary Stop, which, when depressed, would produce a sound similar to a cymbal. I remember playing on one of these pianos in Beirut when they still existed in the 1970s. Turkish symbols, as they became known in the 18th century, were certainly nothing new in Asia Minor and specifically in Armenia. According to the Encyclopedia of Percussion, edited by John Beck, by the 16th century not only was Armenia known as a symbol-making center, but also Armenia was known all over Asia and Europe as the place to visit if one were interested in vessels and containers made of fine quality bronze. One of the preeminent members of this Armenian artisan community was Avedis Ziljian I. Avedis was born on February 20th, 1596. His father, a metalsmith, was already in the Sultan's employ. Young Avedis worked alongside his father. He developed a particular interest in alchemy. Like most alchemists of the period, Avedis conducted experiments aimed at finding the secret of creating gold from combining base metals with different concoctions of chemicals and exotic herbs. During his experiments, according to John Cohen, author of Ziljian, A History of the Legendary Symbol Makers, Avedis stumbled upon a process of making a bronze alloy which held its strength and temper even when hammered and worked to previously unimaginable thinness. Because of this discovery, the Sultan issued a decree in 1618, ordering Avedis to become the royal symbol maker. Avedis was awarded 80 gold pieces and officially received the surname Ziljian or Ziljian. Zil meaning symbol in Turkish. G suffix meaning maker and Yan the Armenian suffix meaning son of or the family of. In 1623, Sultan Murad IV allowed Avedis to leave the palace to establish his private factory in Istanbul. The Ziljan foundry was built in Samatya and continued, according to Cohen, not only to make symbols for the Janissary band, but also for the Armenian and Greek churches, where symbols were used to accentuate the hymns and chants of the religious ceremonies. Returning to the siege of Vienna in 1683, one can safely assume Europeans were introduced to Ziljan symbols, a name which would become and remain synonymous with symbols to the present time. More on that later. As Europeans continued to develop the inclusion of percussion in their orchestral notation, the Mehtara musicians of the Ottoman army and the musical el elites in the Ottoman Empire realized that the oral dissemination system of their music was not enough. There was a need for a standard notation system through which the Mehtare could learn and teach their music to the next generation. In the 17th and 18th centuries, several attempts were made to establish a unique musical system to notate Ottoman music. This work was done primarily by non-Turkish citizens of the empire. 
This process began with Ali Ufki, 1610 to 1675, who was born Wojciech Bobowski in Bobowa, Poland, into a Protestant family and worked as a church musician. In 1637, he was captured by the Ottomans and sold to the court of Sultan Murad IV because of his abilities in reading and notating music. He was converted to Islam and given the name Santuri Ali Ufki and worked in the court as a translator and musician. Ufki Bobovsky's works include a grammar of the Ottoman Turkish language, 1666, and translation of the Bible into Turkish, the Kitabi Mukaddis, holy book. As a musician, in 1665, he composed 14 psalms in Turkish, known as Mezmurlar. These were based on the melodies of the Genevan Psalter, which Ufki rearranged into Turkish modes. Ufki has two collections of anthologies of Ottoman music titled Mejmua Isaz Usos, collection of instrumental and vocal works, which include both traditional sacred and secular instrumental and vocal Turkish music. Following in Ufki's, Ufki's footsteps was Kanter Mir Oglu, 1673 to 1723, or known as Prince Dimitri Kantemir of Moldova. Apparently, the Kantemirs, whose family name originated from Khan Temir, were descendants, descendants of Tamerlane. An, 18, an enlightened intellectual, philosopher, historian, composer, musicologist, and linguist, Khan Temir was born in Romania. Studying Greek and Latin, he developed the mastery of the classics. During his exile in Istanbul in 1600s to 1710, he studied the history of Ottoman Empire and learned Turkish at the Academy of the Greek Patriarchate. Kantemir's most important musical achievement was notation of 350 instrumental works through a notation system which he developed and presented to Sultan Ahmed III. Despite their importance in collecting Ottoman music and pioneering the creation of a notation system, Ufki's and Kantemir's work remain important only as historical records. Eventually, the notation system that came to be widely accepted was none other than the one created by Hamparzu Limongian. Limonjan, 1768 to 1839, respectfully referred to as Baba Hamparzum by his Ottoman contemporaries, was born in Constantinople. His father, Sarkis, and his mother, Gadar, or Gadarine, had recently moved to Constantinople from Kharpert. Young Hamparzum apprenticed to be a tailor. However, Hamparzum's primary love was music. He garnered a great knowledge of the ancient sacred repertoire of the Armenian church by regularly singing at church services, where he eventually became a deacon and choir master. Limonjan was lucky enough to gain the patronage of Amira Hovannes Celebi Duzian, director of the Ottoman Imperial Mint. The young musician lived at the Duzian Palace for a while, where he was introduced to many uh, intellectuals of the period. Limongen was able to further delve into music studies and concentrate on research. Simultaneous to his work as in Armenian music, Limongen displayed a great interest in the music of the dervishes of the Mevlevi order. In order to learn their music, he worked with many of the leading Ottoman composers and musicians of the period. It is during this time that Sultan Selim III, who himself was a musician, requested from the leading musicians of Constantinople to develop a notation system for Ottoman music. Several systems were presented to Selim III. Limongian's notation, which he developed between 1813 and 1815, was preferred over the others and ultimately became the functional notation for Turkish and Armenian music. The Limongian notation system is based on the symbols derived from the ancient Armenian church notation called Khaz. The system remained in use until the early 20th century. In fact, Komidas often used Limongian's system of notation as he recorded folk songs throughout Armenia. It is <clears throat> during this period in the 1830s when publisher Hovannes Mohendisyan, a student of Limongian, established his publishing company, which became one of the most successful in the Ottoman Empire. His print shop even prepared the plates for Ottoman currency. He was also the first publisher to print musical scores to Armenian music compositions. In 1826, Sultan Muhammad Mahmud II disbanded the Janissary force and dispersed the Mahthari musicians of the army. The Sultan went on to invite Italian composer and conductor Giuseppe Donizetti, 
brother of Gaetano Donizetti, the famous opera composer, to replace the Mehetare with modern European-style military bands and become the music director of Imperial Musical Endeavors. Donizetti Pasha, as he became known, composed several marches and anthems and became very popular in Constantinople. This began a period when Italian songs, and especially opera, garnered great popularity in the palace and in Constantinople. An Italian-style opera theater was built, and in 1840, Gaetano Donizetti's opera, Belisario, became the first opera translated into Turkish, and was performed in the newly built theater. This was followed by a series of regular opera performances by Italian composers and Italian opera companies for the next four decades. Musicologist Melich Dürklu, in article co-written with Cemal Unlu, explains that the Sultan and the aristocracy had become interested in operettas. Under the influence of Italian operettas, a Turkish operetta tradition began to become popular by means of the many musical theater companies in Constantinople, which were composed chiefly of Armenian musicians. The authors continued on by stating that the Turkish operetta tradition began with the staging of Dikran Chukhadjian's musical Arif and rose to its zenith with Chukhadjian's famous musical Leblebici Horhoraga, which was staged many times by many different companies, also had the distinction of being the most performed play, which for the first time went on a foreign tour. Dikran Shulhajian, 1837 to 1898, was born in Constantinople. His initial musical training was with composer Gabriele Ranian and Italian composer Mangioni, after which he continued his higher education at, Milan, at the Milan Conservatory. Shulhajian returned to Constantinople where, where he collaborated with the Armenian Musical Society, performed concerts, presented lectures. He took part in the publication of the musical journal, journal Knar Haigagan, Armenian liar, with his former teacher Gabriel, Gabriel Yeranian. He composed salon type pieces for piano, songs and romances, but most importantly, with his, with his chamber orchestra, he collaborated with the Armenian theater companies of Constantinople, composing incidental music and eventually operas and operettas. Juhajian's first full fledged opera, Arshak II, was completed in 1868. It was initially composed with an Italian libretto by Tovmas Terzian, also known as Tommaso Terziani. It was never staged in his lifetime. Its formal debut, albeit with a revised version and with an Armenian libretto, was given in 1945 in Yerevan by the Spendiarian Opera and Ballet Theatre of Armenia. In 2001, it was staged at the San Francisco Opera. Chukhajian turned his attention to composing operettas. Practically all of Chukhajian's operas, operettas were composed with Turkish librettos and later translated into Armenian, including Arif, composed in 1872, Kehya, the Beardless Elder, in 1873, Leblebici Horhoraga, the Peace Seller, in 1876, and Zemire, in 1890. For many Turks and especially Armenians, Chukhajian stands as a pioneer in establishing an operetta tradition for both peoples. The criticism one oft hears of Chukhajian is that his music is overly influenced by the Italian music of the period and it does not fuse either people's indigenous music, albeit in European classical musical language and or expression. In 1851, Avedis Ziljan II, the second, formally gave the symbol company its name, Avedis Ziljan Company. The same year, realizing that bigger markets awaited in Europe, Avedis II had a 25-foot sailing vessel built and traveled with it from Constantinople to Marseille and London, presenting his symbols at world exhibitions. Ziljan's symbols soon garnered fame as the manufacturer won awards of excellence at the fairs. In fact, some classical composers insisted that orchestras use Ziljan symbols for performances of their compositions. After his death, Avedis II's brother Kerov Beziljan took over the business in 1865 and managed the company for 44 years until 1909. 
Upon Kerovpe's death in 1909, the Ziljan company secret was passed to Kerovpe's nephew, Aram, the second son of Abedis II. Aram was actively involved in the Armenian independence movement. After participating in an assassination attempt of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, he was forced to flee to Bucharest. Aram opened the second Ziljan factory in Bucharest while Kerovpe's daughter Victoria and her husband stepped in to keep the factory running in Samatia. In 1927, Aram Ziljan sent a letter to his nephew Avedis III, who had moved to the United States in 1909. Aram requested that Avedis move back to Istanbul to run the family business. Avedis, who was married by then and had children, already had a successful candy business in Massachusetts. At the encouragement of his wife, Avedis convinced Aram to move the symbol business to America. Aram agreed and came to America to help Avedis set up the Ziljan Symbol Foundry in the United States. The company was incorporated in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1929. Avedis III was able to take advantage of the musical needs of American musicians. With the ever-changing musical styles of the 20th century, from jazz to swing to rock and roll, the Ziljan company provided newer and refined models of symbols to meet the ever-changing needs of musicians and musical styles. In the famous 1964 appearance of the Beatles on the American television, drummer Ringo Starr used the Ziljan symbols. The very next day, the company received orders of 90,000 symbols. <laughs> Avedis III was succeeded by his son, Armand. He, in turn, was succeeded by his daughter, Craigie Ziljan, who became the first woman to be appointed CEO of the Ziljan company in 1999. Clearly, I could not end today's presentation without speaking about Gomidas's contributions. Toward the end of the 19th century, nationalist composers in Europe had begun the systematic collection and notation of folk songs, melodies, and dances. Gomidas, in tune with this movement, had begun doing the same in Western and Eastern Armenia. By the time Gomidas arrived in Constantinople in 1910, he had done a tremendous amount of work, not only collecting more than 3,000 Armenian songs, but also Kurdish and Turkish folk songs. He also regularly presented lectures in comparative analysis of the aforementioned folk songs. He was in the process of publishing his findings and collections when his work was cut short on April 24, 1915. Komidas did not suffer the fate of his compatriots. He was saved by the intervention of influential officials. However, he suffered a fate far worse than death. On his return from exile, he found his home ransacked and his community destroyed. This, coupled with the loss of his friends and his entire life's work, proved too much to bear for the sensitive artist. Gomidas suffered a breakdown, and from 1915 until uh, his death in 1935, he lived in a French sanitarium in complete mental darkness, suffering from incessant nightmarish hallucinations. <clears throat> Two years after Gomidas's tragic death in 1937, the Hungarian composer Bela Bartok, who was doing similar work to Gomidas, of collecting folk songs in Eastern Europe, was invited by Ataturk's government to lecture on musical folklore in Ankara and to assist the Turkish government in organizing a collection of Turkish folk music. <coughs> Bartok was taken to the vicinity of Adana to collect folk songs from the nomadic Ulush tribe <coughs> that had settled permanently near Adana 70 years before. His immediate reaction upon hearing the folk songs was that they were variations of old Hungarian melodies. It was apparent that the tribe was brought to these parts from Hungary 70 years ago. Bartok wrote an article about his experience titled On Collecting Folk Songs in Turkey. During his travels, after hearing several male singers, Bartok requested to hear some lullabies sung by female singers. However, the women, under no conditions, would open their mouths and sing us songs without their husbands permitting them to do so, writes Bartok. Frustrated, he wrote a complaint to Ankara. It is impossible situation to have, a, to, have to record lullabies in croaking men's voices when it was obvious that men never lulled their babies to sleep either with or without singing. One evening, Bartok's group was taken to a big gathering where two musicians, where two musicians began playing. This is how Bartok describes the scene. People began dancing. And what a dance this was. The music was strange, almost frightening. 
One of the musicians played an instrument called Zurna. The other had a big drum called Davun, slung over his shoulder. He beat his drum using a wooden stick with a diabolical fierceness so that I expected that either his drum or my eardrums would split any moment. <laughs> Certainly Bartok found himself in an unfamiliar environment. One cannot help but wonder about the irony that a government who would be so interested in preserving their folk songs would not value a musician like Gominath, the ideal ethnomusicologist, to do this work, and instead invite musicologists who really had nothing in common with the music to take on this task. In conclusion, the Armenians regarded themselves as citizens of the Ottoman Empire and intended to improve the musical life of the empire. But a few important examples of these efforts have been discussed, from the Ziljan family to the likes of Hamparzum Limonjian, whose notation system served the dissemination of Ottoman music in written form for almost two centuries, to Dikran Shuhadjian, who single-handedly established not only a Turkish, but also Armenian operatic tradition. Last but not least, Gomidas, who objectively collected and notated the folk songs of the people who lived harmoniously through their indigenous music. We did not touch upon the liter literally hundreds of Armenian ashik or popular singers who were acclaimed as composers of classic and popular Turkish songs throughout the empire, as well as many, many others who contributed to the musical life of the empire in one way or another. Suffice it to say that the ethnic and Armenian influence, influence on Turkish music has and continues to leave indelible traces which harmonizes an entire tradition, a harmony which unfortunately remains elusive to the peoples that inhabit this ancient land. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Van Aroyan, whose uh, original real name is Vahan, I found out this morning. Uh, Mr. Uh, Van or Vahan Aroyan started his career as teacher of social studies at the prep school and college level. He continued in urban renewal as researcher, planner, and administrator. His last undertaking was importing and retailing of oriental rugs with partner and brother-in-law Kevork Balakjian. Aroyan is also an independent researcher. As such, he has studied the rich photographic collection of the famed Abdullah or Abdullayan brothers at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. His talk is titled The Abdullah Frères and Armenian Contribution to Photography in the Ottoman Empire. Mr. Aroyan. for something we all need and use nowadays. It's uh, a cell phone. It's also my point of contact to you. I'll bet almost everybody in this room is able to make a camera out of whatever they're having, whether it's a smartphone or a, or a cell phone. It's such a part of our life that it's become a habit and a habit that we take for granted. But just think a moment about what photography did. It opened up history to a visual rather than merely a written story. It can be used to manipulate history. It can be used to portray history. We use it in our personal lives. We celebrate our great events and our sad events. So. It's a remarkable invention, so I want to take a moment just to uh, expose some of that beginning. Hopefully. Yeah, whoops, that's too fast. Uh, oh, another thing that, that uh, can you hear me back there? Because I don't like mics. Uh, if you can hear me, I'm going to roam around a bit. Um, uh, the, the other big product that we get out of photography, it seems to be able to focus very well on the beauty. So I can't begin a speech without showing you 
at least one beautiful woman. <laughs> and since I want to be fair, this was done by Le Kegyan, and I would say I have to be fair to my Abdullah brothers. This is the, a picture of some elegant ladies with their nagulas in a very formal pose within the studio. Well, the boss says I've got to uh, use this. But he, he doesn't know my temperament. He'll soon see differently. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, the Armenians were all over the uh, empire. And, and in that empire, as photographers, they had a major role, the dominant role, I would say. This is just one page of two pages that I collected that shows about 78 Armenian photographers when I did this back around 2000, they easily could be numbered now well over 100 because the names keep popping up. We keep learning more about them. Um, by the way, the era that the Abdullah brothers were working in was a revolutionary era. We went from the handmade to the manufactured machinery made. We call that the Industrial Revolution. And so, uh, I like this picture for a reason. I wonder if anybody here can tell why this picture has a symbol in it of change. Can anybody react to it? Well, we don't have the time to show it too much. The, the gentleman's father is wearing a turban. That's old fashioned. His little son is wearing a fez. That's the new babe on the street. So we're in a period of change. And we went from hand etching, handmade pictures, to chemically processed capturing of light. We call that photography. And that was the first film production that was photographing a, a actual the world. It was Lagrade taking a picture out of his farm window of the farmstead. And that was in 1827. By 1838, his partner, uh, Louis Daguerre, had developed the daguerreotype. And you can see a fascinating difference within eight years, nine years, 10 years. Look at that detailed difference. And there's also a man in that picture getting his shoes shined. But we're not going to bother pointing him out to you. And we come to the Abdullah brothers. Fascinating family, fascinating. The, the, the writer of the book that I depended on mostly for this information is a lady by the name of Engin Ozendis. And she traces the family back to Gesaria to 1610. But one of the offspring uh, came to Boas in 1750s and became the purchasing agent for the Sultan. He was so loved and so respected for his honesty and admired for his modest ways that they urged, as the word she uses, we might have said pressed, him to become a Muslim. And he had a very nice way of dealing with that. He said, well, let me tell you, my name is Asfazadur, God-given. Said, if you want, you can call me Abdullah. God's servant. And that way, you will be pleased, and I will have satisfied my conscience. I think uh, Henry Kissinger could have taken a few lessons from that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very powerful uh, answer to things. But anyway, uh, what makes these guys the great photographers they are? Well, they had tremendous technique. They had great control over the technology, the chemistry that was involved, and the, um, oops, I'm going too fast here. Yeah, okay, what made them credible? I think one of the reasons we can say what made them credible were the pictures that they took, the portraits that they took. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? And it sure is Mark Twain, bravo. I thought somebody would say he looks like a good Armenian. And I, oops, so that was Mark. And this is the picture that got them on their springboard. In 1863, uh, Abdul Aziz 
had uh, a portrait painted by a European painter whose name I don't know, and um, he wasn't pleased with it. So his vizier said, well, why don't you call in the Abdullah Freres and have them take a portrait? I think you'll be satisfied. And they did, and obviously he says it himself. My countenance and true likeness is in the true photograph taken by the Abdullah brothers. Henceforth, they, I will only use their photographs, and he says I will name them artists to his imperial majesty. So they became the imperial photographers to three sultans, um, starting with Aziz. And that was then shown at the exposition in Paris of 1867, an international exposition where there were 52,000 exhibitors. And uh, that portrait uh, won a lot of attention and many of the photographs that they showed. And hopefully, I don't know which ones they showed, so I'm gonna just take you through a, a group of photographs that they took. But uh, if Abdul Aziz doesn't validate, well, maybe this gentleman will, because he became the future king of England, and he invited the Abdullah brothers to open up a studio in London. They never did, and they were sorry of the fact that they never did, ultimately. And when he became king, he named them his royal photographers. So I think uh, we can show that they have some uh, good stripes on their skirt. And the artistry is shows for, well, how did they do a picture like this? This is a fishing scene. It's also a rather fishy story <laughs> because this is a studio shot, yeah. obviously. Um, yeah. The waves, an Abdullah Frere invention. They took a sharp pointed instrument and drew it through the gel of the negative and created an image of water. They were bright guys, knew what they were doing. And they posed. They were as good indoors as they were outdoors. And they, they were also very much masters of shadow and light. And what else is there in photography? They composed, they had tremendous eye for composition, but look at the wonderful use of light in here and the shadows. And the portraiture was such that Engin Ozenti says their, ta their talent and skill brought people's portraits to life. And I think if you look at this elegant lady, elegantly dressed, you can might well agree with that story. And since our lives were touched by Nansen, and this was a major source of money for all the studios in Boas. They developed something called carte de visite, uh, obvious term. It was a cart that they were swapping all around the city because if you had money and affluence and wanted to show your latest uh, smartphone, you uh, swapped these cards and everybody knew you were in. So I thought Nansen would be a nice portrait since we all know what he did for us and our people, but I never knew a picture of them existed until I saw this one. And this is a, just a, one more set of carte de visites, mother and son team. And this is the Starbucks representative in <laughs> How's that helpful? Um, a remarkable picture. If you look at, if you can see his face, he certainly is an advertisement for the coffee he's selling. He just loves drinking what he's selling. And, you know, that whole assemblage can be torn down in a few minutes and moved on to where the traffic warrants that position. It's just great. And their outdoor scenes are just as great as their portraits. And um, why should we not show the worst as well as the best? Boas was very much prone to fires. It was a, it was a terrible experience. These tightly dense areas with this old wood would turn into flame and consume districts, areas, all over the city. And I remember an old American lady who described it as a frightening experience to live there with those fires. Okay. So, of course, we're now in the age of the Tanzimat from 1839 on. We had to reform our government because we were not treating our minorities so well. 
And so we had a two-fold uh, modernization program. One, to bring civil liberties and human rights to the minorities, which failed. And secondly, to modernize the empire and uh, lose its sickness. So one of the things we have here is, that's actually a pump in the middle of where they're standing, and they would carry that pump to the fire and connect it up to a hose. I don't know where the water was, because I don't know anything about the sewer system or the water system. And this is a, another picture that the Abdullah Frez took of their co-Armenian cohorts and fellow Amiras, um, the Bayan brothers. Doma Bache was built by Sarkis, and Nigahos, one the architect, the other the, the construction engineer. And if I'm correct in my memory, the Balyans served the sultans for about 140 years, and I think they numbered six different sultans that they served as the royal imperial architects. So it was a great family. But I like this photograph for another reason. It's, here are the Abdullah brothers who are creating a gift for Abdul Hamid to send to the King of Spain of an album of monuments all around the city. And uh, who does he hire to do this but the Abdullah Frères? And I like to say that that sort of portrays our Armenian footprint all over the city and all over the empire. It's a fabulous collaboration. And. Uh, by the way, uh, Kevok, who is the brightest one of the three, wasn't very diplomatic. When the Russian-Russo-Turkish War was completed and the Turks lost that war in 1878, um, he was invited to take photographs of about 100 of the top military people in the Russian army. And then after he finished taking their photographs, he invited him to dinner at his home. Sultan Abdul Hamid was a man with an extensive spy system. It didn't take long for him to know what they had done. And so he uh, took away their imperial photog photography role. And they are now uh, on the downward trend because th that took away a big publicity issue for them. So uh, the Khedive of Egypt invited Kevor and uh, Hosep to come to Egypt and to open up a Ottoman art photography studio. Because most of the uh, photographers that were running around Egypt at the time were archaeologists from the West and uh, tourists. So he said, well, you know, we deserve to have our own tradition of photographers. So they went on a tour. The Khedid is the man with the modern fez and his wife next to him on the right, his right, and uh, they toured along the Nile River and uh, took pictures of antiquities. And when they got to uh, the Karnak and the, at, uh, the, the temple of Karnak at Luxor, I'm going to read you what uh, impressed Baron Kevor. Nowhere in, the, nowhere in the world can buildings of such magnificent size be seen. The crudest of men could hardly be left unmoved by such historical remains. The sight of 156 columns standing is awe-inspiring. Each column is about 40 inches wide and 18 meters in height, carved from top to bottom with likenesses of the pharaohs to immortalize their memories. And then he goes on to observe that the monuments that have fallen on the ground are as if abandoned to be forgotten. So there's a contrast, right, between the memorialization and the forgetting. And I'll return to that theme before I'm finished. This is 1890. Sultan Abdul Hamid had a project in his mind, so he thought he should bring the imperial status back to the Abdullah brothers. 
And the project was go around the empire and take pictures of what looks like and shows the advance that we have made as a society. So they took thousands of pictures. And he gifted to the Library of Congress and to the British Museum 51 volumes of 1,800 pictures of photographs of, of whatever these Abdullah brothers and other photographers took. But more than three quarters of the pictures that he sent were done by Abdullah Freya. Of course, he had to make sure that they put in medical facilities. And I think you would agree that if you had to be in um, Tur Turkey, you couldn't have had a better facility than this. Just look at how immaculately clean and bright the nurses and the patients are and the facility. Boy, I've caught up with you guys in the West. And he didn't pick a men's ward. He picked a women's ward. I wonder why. For the same reason that when they went and they were picking schools and they were building schools all over the empire, we have women who are learning. And we had life saving. But the one I like to stress is this one, the military. He had modernized his army. He modernized his navy and artillery drill on board ship. And he even had a torpedo factory to make torpedoes. So I like this picture too because it gives me another foothold. That I don't know why Kemal Ataturk and Abdul Hamid had such a fear of the Armenians when at the end of this period of time, the Ottoman army was considered to be the best at its best height in the past previous hundred years. So the Armenians must have had a tremendous revolutionary development and a huge force that were going to be able to take these guys on. I don't know why we lost. <laughs> Now, here's the Red Kaiser. Oh, I meant the Red Sultan. But the word Red Kaiser comes from Kevok. Before Kevok died in 1918, and shortly after Abdul Hamid died in 1918, Kevok published an essay he had written but never dared to show. And it was, the title was, and I think it speaks for what he must have written, The Red Kaiser, meaning the Sultan. All right. Uh, he also published a, an article, uh, post, not posthumously, but uh, under somebody else's name, which talked about the condition of the Armenians in the forgotten areas of Asia Minor. What kind of an impact? Well, here we have. I'd like you to read that. This is from the international press. Whether this is the Times of London or the Times of New York, it doesn't matter. It's a prestigious world-class newspaper. And the reviewer says, <clears throat> we don't know who these guys are, but they certainly their photos are excellent. This was from the exposition that I spoke about in 1867. And England quotes from the photo of its age, the travel guide of Murray's. Their skills earned them an international reputation. No one has managed to approach them in the field of photography as yet. Five minutes. Wow. Okay. So, obviously we know where this is. Look at the magnificence of composition of this photo. Mm -hmm. There is the pyramids in the sterile desert, surrounded and focused with this line of trees, life, the water, and the animals, and the people. It's an extraordinary composition. There's no way of missing out on where you're going or what you're seeing. And Kevok took this picture on that trip along the, the Nile that they originally went on. So I, I think, uh, oh, wow, Abdullah Frez, getting close to the end. <clears throat> this is somebody whose name I don't know. I just made sure that I had titled it Abdullah Frez, so you know they took the picture. And according to Engin, Right? What kind of impact did they have? They had an impact on art. She says they had four similar photographs as this one, all in her collection. And uh, obviously, 
an inspiration to one of our great artists, and God knows how many others they could have been inspirations to. Yeah, I never knew that Yeth Pimeu, I couldn't find anything about her, but that she was an actress, I'm glad to know. I know that she wrote poetry, and she was, he was very much admired, and should have been. He was a, a brilliant guy. Uh, at the Raphael Muratian School, at the Murad Raphaelian School in Venice, uh, he took first place in Armenian, French, and English, piano and art, chemistry, and uh, metaphysics. He only took second place in Italian. He mastered German, Greek, and French. I don't think the guy uh, had anything to be ashamed of. And uh, he was very much admired. Their studio was a studio where, where Turkish and Armenian intellects gathered. And Yethimir was one of his admirers. And I played with her poem because time is, the guy's there watching me. Uh, <laughs> she called him his shadow. And what's happening is she has a fear of death. So she writes, your shadow, chin on hand I sat upon the seaweed and the scattered poises of pale lights made the sweet dreams of my spirit take wing, sprinkling love and compassion as terror sees in my eyes at the point of death, sprinkling love and compassion on my tired brow. And Kevok brilliantly writes back in poetic essay form and in poetry, a, a rather long answer, a rebuttal or a, a communication rather, he says, on my own path into my own problems, he says, come let us gird the wings of immortal mortality together let us spread roses on the path we walk, sprinkling love and compassion on my tired brow, right? Let us fly through the door, let us spread roses on the path we walk, let us fly through the door of eternity for the unknown our shadows seek. So he fused his shadow with hers in support of her. The guy just had a great talent, an extraordinary man. But oh, I'm back in Luxor because Oh, before I do that, I should tell you that Hossa, uh, Vigen, Vigen in 1899 converted to Islam. And I say that he really has his great grandfather to be thankful for the fact that he was able to keep to the name Abdullah, because he took the name Abdullah Shukru, Abdullah the Grateful. Well, he didn't have to change anything but add shukru to it. So it's a brilliant move. His move contradicts the move of his great grandfather, doesn't it? Huh? Aswazadur, God given, and this gentleman. I don't know why he converted. But back here now in uh, Luxor, we look at this temple and we know that we were awe inspired and that we were uh, immortalizing the pharaohs. But we also know that he saw the monuments on the ground as if forgotten to be abandoned. So I'd like you to join me, if you can, to do what we can to add the name of the Abdullah brothers to the names of the great Armenian contributors to both the Ottoman Empire and in many ways to the world of photography. Thank you. <laughs>